so um, I guess we'll go ahead and and get started. Um, and Alex, you can. There's a couple notes coming in. Some some uh, colleagues are joining us from all over the country, so that's great. Yeah. So ho that's hello to all of you. Yeah. To see the way we say hello these days. Yeah. Um, um, okay. Let me hide the chat for a second. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, hello everyone. I'm Patty Hayda. I'm associate professor at the School here of Urban Design, Architecture, Landscape Architecture at the Sam Fox School at Washington University. And we are super excited to have Alex Krieger with us today. I had the pleasure of studying under Alex, um, not formally as a student at the GSD, like you might think, but actually in the context of his practice. I think that's something that um, is rare maybe in, in some practices today that you get the sort of ethos of academia and you can ask questions and be provocative a little bit with clients. Um, so it's a real treat to have Alex here who brings a wealth of experience and knowledge about urban design in American cities. Um, just a very briefly, Alex is currently principal at NBBJ, which is a global design firm. Um, I knew him from the days at Chan Krieger Sinevich, which was his, his firm where it all started, an architecture planning urban design firm, um, before it merged with MBBJ. And there are projects from that firm that are still unfolding in cities in Pittsburgh and Washington, D.C., and even Harvard's back door um, or front door, <laughs> new front door in Alston as the, the university expands its campus. Um, so Harvard, uh, Harvard, Alex is research professor in practice of urban design at Harvard University Graduate School of Design. He has served as chair of the Department of Urban Planning and Design and directed the urban design program and chaired the Department of Architecture, among other things there. Um, but he is actually also famous for his American Cities class that he pulled out of the Graduate School of Design and brought into the more general education lineup at Harvard College. And I think this, this is a great sort of recognition of the fact that cities are, um, you know, design is central to cities, but also um, so many people make the cities. So it's really important that um, we are teaching future policymakers and lawyers and environmentalists about uh, design, but also that we're um, bringing other expertise into the making of the city. Um, Alex has, uh, has also articulated with the public sector. Um, he served as a member on the United States Commission of Fine Arts and founded the Big City Planning Directors Institute and directed the Mayor's Institute on City Design among other Boston commissions and boards. Um, so I think that's really interesting too that I want to come back to and talk about um, just the sort of interface between working in the public sector, practicing and teaching. And um, of course he's contributed to the literature on planning and urban design and we read your work, Alex, in our classes. Um, but his new book is called City on a Hill, Urban Idealism in America for, from the Puritans to the Present. And he's going to talk today um, on that book. The talk is called Designing the American City, Aspirations on Urban Form. So without further ado, Alex, I will let you take it away. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Patty. Thank you for inviting me and uh, nice to see you. Uh, and those of you who are almost visible as well, uh, some, some I know are friends from back when and uh, uh, will be so again. So. Uh, uh, okay, so let me uh, pull up my uh, screen. Uh, can you see, uh, somebody could say yes, Patty, can you see the screen? Yes, right? yep. yes. Okay, yes. So, uh, so of course, uh, you know, I, uh, I've changed the title, I change it all the time for such talks. Uh, so, uh, so I thought it would be more uh, sort of pertinent to say the American city prior to, which is sort of what the book is about, 
and possibly following the pandemic, which is where I will sort of end uh, the talk today uh, with a little bit of optimism. Uh, and then also, uh, as is the book that Penny mentioned, uh, the role of ideals in the design of American settlement. Now you might say, are you kidding me? You're gonna talk about ideals uh, now amidst this kind of panoply of, of crises, multiple and actually interrelated crises, uh, you know, you must be tone deaf or you must be some kind of a, you know, kind of a impossible ro ro romantic. But let me say that actually ideals have been essential to uh, uh, American urbanization uh, since actually the beginning uh, and actually should, should resurface today, in my opinion, as a way to actually emerge, uh, hopefully, from uh, some of these kind of uh, crises that we have sort of upon us at the moment. Uh, so it's important to understand, right, that uh, 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 an idea about America preceded the arrival of any Americans, other than those, of course, that were already here. <laughs> Uh, and that's very important. So the idea, and the idea was about sort of beginnings as this kind of quite famous quote from John Locke is in the beginning, all the world was America. The idea, in fact, the notion of a utopia, that Thomas More's utopia was written in part as a, as a uh, indication of the discovery of the Nye Welt as that sort of partial map says in the middle of the new world. And indeed as other kind of uh, scholars of the 16th century and so forth would prompt thought that this would be a kind of a possibility a return to paradise. Well, it hasn't quite been quite a return to paradise. Uh, and yet uh, the notion of beginnings and therefore transformability uh, have been a rather sort of constant for good and bad across American history. Uh, so indeed, one of those sort of a, a, a transformabilities has been an almost constant or generational assassination that has recurred across American history between the allure of living in a city, the allure of making a city, and the allure of leaving it or living free of the various city stresses. Uh, and there are libraries of books uh, about how great cities are, but also the shame of the cities as this sort of late 19th century uh, book is in the upper left. Uh, and there are of course some books that extol the virtues of the suburb. And of course, more recently, uh, more commonly things like the book on the bottom right saying, bomb the suburbs, because of course, as the quote below says, uh, they're uh, you know, unfortunate, uh, they're uh, founded on fear, conformity, shallowness, and so on. And this sort of assassination, not so much between cities and suburbs, uh, per se, but uh, cities and something as an alternative to the stress of cities have been one of the constants, which in a sense is what I will try to describe. All right, so uh, over the last couple of decades, and again, as an entire library shelf can uh, describe, there's been this uh, kind of urban revival, uh, probably extolled more, more emphatically than it actually was occurring uh, by, of course, pundits like, you know, my, I and maybe Patty and so forth. Yes, cities are back, uh, uh, sprawl kills, uh, suburbs are uh, yesterday, uh, they're a dead end. We've discovered that there's sex in the city, how, you know, how, how, who would not like that and so forth. Uh, and indeed, uh, better than any of these uh, books, uh, there's Zippy around the turn of the millennium, right, saying good for you a very traditional sort of urban scene and bad for you. And indeed, you know, here's a kind of a typical headline from sort of mid, mid decade uh, that we just uh, sort of crossed, uh, jobs growing in city centers, shrinking in suburban areas. So indeed, there seemed to be a kind of a shift in sensibilities over the last couple of decades as a consequence of the fact that the prior, you know, sort of half century or so was really more about sort of suburbanization and its benefits, at least to a majority of Americans, at least in their own minds. So again, this assassination, I think, uh, will continue. And so having kind of said, oh my goodness, cities are back. Well, the, the, the virus uh, has come and all of a sudden there are headlines and they continue. Uh, and even sort of against all reason, predicting that of course, we will sort of leave our cities uh, out of fear about congestion and the spread of disease and so forth. And I would say that this is uh, quite exaggerated, though some of it will occur and is occurring in part as part of this sort of a generational shift back and forth that is very typically American, again, under the kind of ideal of new beginnings, right? By the way, realtors, you see at the bottom, predict mass move to suburbs. Well, of course, realtors would always predict this because that's how they make their money if more of us move are often. But so don't believe this entirely. However, I will say something provocative uh, and perhaps get to it at the end, 
we actually need to sprawl more. Now, not, not in terms of uh, you know, suburban subdivisions on the outskirts of, uh, uh, of existing cities. That's not what I mean. We need a kind of a new form of sprawl uh, to uh, overcome uh, uh, current crises. And that has to do maybe with uh, trying to kind of uh, 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 you know, uh, overcome the sort of horrible segregation that we experience as this map indicates between you know, race uh, and income levels and political persuasiveness and, and values and, and city versus and non-city and so forth. So in that sense, we need to kind of uh, forg forgive the word sprawl because it's often used in a very pejorative uh, sense. We need to kind of sprawl a little bit more uh, to overcome some of the difficulties that we're facing right now as an American culture. All right, so, but let's begin actually. So, uh, you know, the most sort of authoritative for almost two centuries description of America, at least during its sort of foundational period was of course, democracy in America. And the opening sentence, literally the opening sentence of this, uh, of this book, uh, I don't know how many of you have looked at it recently, says no novelty in the United States struck me more vividly than equality of conditions. So there's that kind of initial aspiration uh, never entirely met, of course, but initial aspiration uh, having to do with American idealism, the, the starting over uh, under the ideal of achieving a certain level of equality, at least, by the way, at the time, kind of for, you know, mostly for men and uh, not, not, you know, slaves hardly, or the indigenous populations. Well, unfortunately, at the moment, we're, we're sort of experiencing a huge opposite of this as both the photograph and the cartoon uh, describes. But uh, to get to a beginning, uh, uh, here's the gentleman, right? And by the way, the numbers will, uh, will, uh, will uh, respond to various chapters in the book. And by the way, if you happen to kind of uh, uh, find, such, find a book somewhere, uh, you don't have to read it from one to 18 and I will not go through all 18 chapters. I assure you, uh, you can sort of uh, look, you can sort of identify an issue each chapter identifies a particular issue in this sort of period of um, oscillation uh, between kind of cities and the antidote uh, or improvement to cities that Americans have been trying to kind of uh, deal with and invent over time. Well, the person who had the kind of clearest view about what an American society uh, uh, ought to be was in fact Thomas Jefferson, who imagined a kind of an egalitarian agrarian republic, and he set out with a particular device uh, to assure that that would happen, right? He uh, releases uh, a, a continental survey, uh, and that's extended by others over much of the 19th, much of the first half of the 19th century, uh, uh, to create what is extremely uncommon. If you look at the globe, there are not too many sort of uh, half continents <laughs> that look like they were laid out as a piece of graph paper, right? Uh, and it was very precisely uh, uh, done to uh, enable each of us, again, you know, as long as at the time we were male uh, and not a slave, a minority or an Indian, uh, to get a piece of America for ourselves and through it achieve a certain amount of financial stability, independence and well-being. Uh, and indeed, therefore, in Jefferson's mind, the building block of American society was to be, well, the homestead, the kind of individuals or family homestead, as in this case, of course, uh, his own Monticello. Uh, the expectation was that each of us might acquire something like this. Now, by the way, to manage a Monticello required other things, uh, less savory things. So if you have not visited with uh, either with your parents or with your children, whoever is uh, listening uh, to Monticello uh, lately, you should go back because finally after two centuries, there's a little exhibit in honor of Sally Hemings, a slave who fathered six children by Thomas Jefferson. Uh, denied for you know hundreds of years, fake news, fake news, fake news, until of course DNA evidence uh, showed uh, Jefferson's other families. So indeed, uh, the notion of a sort of a homestead uh, came with a certain condition that uh, uh, Jefferson, for all of his idealism, could not, of course, somehow separate himself to his sort of uh, in ending kind of uh, uh, disfavor. But uh, this is what he imagined uh, American, yeah, an American society to become, each of us somehow being able to 
uh, acquire a homestead, maybe not quite as lavish uh, as his own Monticello. And by the way, uh, a kind of a reminder that the, this amazing phrase from the Declaration of Independence, life, liberty, and happiness, was just given that he had a kind of a, a way with words. Uh, all of the initial, uh, all of the initial uh, drafts, including in 17 const state constitutions, it says, life, liberty, and the acquisition and protection of property. In what was during the 19th century thought about as maintaining, it seems naive now, maintaining the garden of the world for all of us to uh, consume, not in the way we think of consumption now, but to all of us sort of benefiting somehow from. All right, so uh, each of us, according to uh, uh, that, uh, that diagram was, uh, uh, was, and you'll see this a little bit later on, was uh, 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 privileged to acquire a quarter section, you might've heard that term, a quarter section, a quarter of a square mile of America uh, for their homestead. Well, uh, we somehow have to settle most of us for a quarter of an acre or actually more often an eighth of an acre instead of a quarter section, but indeed the kind of the, the sort of the long-term sort of uh, origins of this notion is still very much with us. Uh, the notion that uh, uh, acquiring a piece of America will bring with it a certain amount of sort of stability, economic well-being, uh, and possibly even happiness as well as the final draft of the Declaration of Independence corrected, right? Now, uh, the trouble is that uh, Jefferson, wherever he, he, he might be right now, I'm sure is in tears because the notion about equally distributing ourselves uh, across uh, the continent has hardly been the case. So if you translate, uh, uh, if you translate income into land ownership, well, the so-called sort of one percenters would actually own uh, most of the West, not the homesteaders. Uh, and, and the 40% 40 40 of us, which I assume would be most, without presuming too much, most of us in the audience here listening would share that little, uh, little circle in the middle of Texas. So actually uh, this notion about an equalitarian distribution of Americans across uh, the continent, assuring us of a certain amount of uh, equality hardly has uh, uh, come about, at least as a consequence of land ownership. And yet, and this is why American history is so kind of fascinating and so kind of slightly downfounding. And yet, if we sort of avoid our kind of uh, immediate criticisms of suburbia, think about this headline uh, from around 1950 or so. Think about this headline low priced homes suitable for any wage earner. You would not find such a headline in any American newspaper today. Low priced homes, or you could say apartments even, right? Low priced places to live suitable for any wage earner. And yet for a period of time uh, during kind of the middle of the 20th century, uh, actually there seemed to be a way to provide low priced homes for any wage earner, something we have to find a way to return to, or apartments, you might say, right? Not homes, uh, whatever, living conditions uh, uh, for each of us. Uh, and so one of the most famous photographs of the mid 20th century is the one below on the left. The one on the right actually is a promotional photograph. The one on the left uh, from Life Magazine shows, of course, a family, uh, you know, uh, proudly showing itself right in front of a, just a recently acquired home. And my goodness, how wonderful that would be. Refrigerators and uh, televisions uh, included for free as opposed to living in some tenement in lower Manhattan. And the one on the right, of course, uh, uh, sort of idealizes this even further. Again, a promotional photograph, look at this family. How can you not sense a domestic spirit of grace? And I quote this because actually it has to do with uh, chapter six in a book, which is the notion of uh, the origins of the suburb had not had little to do with suburb suburbanization. That's not what people were after. They were after what this pasture, what this preacher from the 19th century uh, suggested and was widely quoted. The home, not the suburb, the home, the home having a domestic spirit of grace dwelling in it should become the church of childhood, the table and heart, a holy site. And actually think about that as an, a, a kind of an ideal or a sort of aspiration. Uh, and by the way, the larger photograph on the left, it happens to be my niece and her family who sent me recently, actually a couple of years ago, 
a picture of them in front of their first home uh, as a young family somewhere in New Jersey. Uh, and by the way, Google families and homes, and there are tens of thousands, possibly hundreds of thousands of images, just like the one uh, that uh, uh, my niece and her husband uh, uh, posed in front of a couple of years ago. So this is not, this is not to be dismissed, uh, uh, this sort of association uh, between, of course, a family uh, and a place of their own of course, idealized and to some extent caricatured and to some extent overpromised by, you know, uh, sort of a shoddy uh, subdivision developers uh, across uh, much of the 20th century. But it is not just an American phenomenon, really, in terms of this idea, not of the suburb, but of the uh, place for one's family. So here's a typical Chinese family, right? One kid, not two, as with my niece. Uh, and of course, most such families uh, in China live in places, uh, as you can see in the right. But here's one of the most, and I've spent a lot of time in China. <laughs> uh, here's one uh, uh, very common, very popular billboard that you see many places in China. And think about that. What the billboard is for is selling drinking water, right? Tap water is not still quite you know, uh, thought of as secure in many places in China. Uh, the billboard is selling bottled water, but look at the background. It's the same family, although the kid is on semi shoulders, but look at the background. It looks exactly like the house that my niece bought and her husband. Uh, and indeed, uh, were it possible and of course, the, even the kind of central government is tr trying to prevent this, except uh, they can't entirely for the wealthiest Chinese. Would it be possible uh, more Chinese families would also, again, not seek a suburb, but seek, of course, uh, a home, a dwelling for themselves. And in this country, obviously, uh, uh, our greatest architect, with apologies to whoever might be your favorite, uh, you know, Frank or, so, or others, uh, uh, he actually extolled this even more through design. Think about how much grace must dwell in some of his sort of amazing uh, houses across uh, his own career. Uh, uh, but indeed, he then makes a bit of a fatal error, if you will. He concludes that the city, which in the, you know, from the mid 19th century on was not assumed to be a replacement for uh, this, uh, the, the suburb was not a replacement for the city. Uh, uh, it was just a way to kind of depart from the stresses of the city for a while in the evenings or on weekends. He assumed that with modern technologies, like cars and like, you know, look at that, he even predicted drones, right? Uh, he assumed that there was, the future would no longer need cities because technology would connect you and provide you whatever a city provides, but you would, in this home of yours that would have grace dwelling in it, would have the benefit of living in a kind of more pastoral, uh, more sort of healing environment. Uh, very much an extension actually of a sort of Jeffersonian idea whom he also quoted uh, periodically. And by the way, he does not invent this. He's a kind of a illustrator. This Broadacres is a kind of an illustration. He kind of was a render of things that were happening. And if you of course look at many parts of our metropolitan outlying metropolitan environments, they actually resemble somewhat, not the strange politics associated with, with uh, Frank Lloyd Wright and his Broadacres, but the kind of the actual environment not so unlike. And so he concluded that cities were no longer necessary in the kind of traditional sense of them as a consequence of modern technologies in this way before, of course, uh, the internet. Uh, but he was not alone. He was hardly alone across American uh, uh, history uh, at all, and especially in the last century and a half. So look at this gentleman. Looks like a fine, I don't know, sort of Princeton grad. Actually, it was Columbia, right? Uh, he was the head, Mr. Tugwell, actually Mr. Tugwell III, he was the head of something called the Resettlement Administration. Think about that as a term. Think about, say, inventing that now, that, uh, that sort of central governmental function, the Resettlement Administration, right? Uh, and uh, uh, this, the cover, the illustration is the cover of one of the publications of the Resettlement Administration when during the Depression, uh, actually cities and especially sort of the monopolizing tendency of capitalism in cities was blamed in part for uh, the depression, uh, that there was a tremendous uh, 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 sort of set of policies created to decentralize, 
And this is where, of course, uh, here it is. Life by the acre seems kind of promising. Life by a square foot, mm, you know, kind of dark, if not black. And so uh, people like Tugwell, not to mention FDR and others, uh, and Frank Lloyd Wright, who was sort of illustrating this future of life by the acre, promising an acre for all, right? Uh, was both extremely attractive, but also supported by a tremendous number of what we would now call subsidizations, although at the time they weren't called that at all, and we may need to invent equivalents of them, not to decentralize, but actually to sprawl in a different way uh, by building actually more cities, but not necessarily more cities at the 10 million scale, some of them. So yes, so of course the federal housing registration, uh, the federal tax code allowing mortgage deductions, the investment of course in, in interstate highways, the, G, the GI bill, all of those actually were subsidies in support of life by the acre versus life by the square foot. Uh, and folks like Tugwell, you know, uh, spent a, a fair amount of his career uh, in doing so. And also in a way, if you read the bottom of the slide predicts what would happen during the urban renewal period as well. He'll come back in a few minutes uh, with that statement below. All right, so of course, if you uh, 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 believe in the notion of a home as being essential to a family, uh, if you believe that grace dwells in a home, if you are supported by uh, these four but other sort of subsidies and public policies, enabling you to acquire life by the acre or by the eighth of an acre for most. Uh, this is where the kind of the idea of the American dream somehow emerges as this sort of book describes. But it has nothing to do with a Mr. Adams, uh, James Threslow Adams had in mind when he coined that term. It had nothing to do with a home or a yard or a suburb. It actually had to do with achieving equal access to opportunity for Americans, right? Again, reaching back to uh, sort of an older idea, right? I, I won't read this to you, but maybe you can sort of read it uh, yourself as the slide remains. So even though the American dream is somehow associated with a home or a yard or home sweet home, actually there was a kind of, if you will, a sort of a bastardization, if I may say, of the intention of that term again, dealing with trying to achieve a certain measure of equal opportunity, if not equality, versus a particular solution for that, uh, uh, in fact, home sweet home. Okay, uh, so, but indeed, you know, uh, most Americans, more than the majority of Americans sought that ideal, assumed that was the American dream and was able to afford it for a period of time in the post-World War II period. So the question might sort of emerge, okay, well, so how come, how come all of a sudden then in the last couple of decades, a, a, a sort of a, an interest in cities emerge, right? And even something called urban decay as a cosmetic, imagine that. I doubt that for those of you who maybe are uh, students, I doubt that your parents would have enjoyed a perfume called urban decay. So how did that happen, right? Well, of course, there are many reasons for this. Many, 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 many reasons, right? You know, uh, the return of sort of labor to the cities, right? Who would not want to be part of the most innovative square mile in the world? As of course, immodest MIT people talk about the innovation ecosystem around the campus, right? So of course, yes, uh, labor return, uh, kind of a advanced post-industrial economies are about sort of interaction, uh, boredom with the suburb. You can list a substantial number of ideas if you are kind of an urban minded pundit about why cities are now, uh, at least before the pandemic, uh, why cities were now uh, the center of sort of American environmental uh, concern and so forth. But one thing is hardly ever described uh, as one of those reasons. Uh, and it's just as important as any other. And it has to do uh, with actuarial, I'm not even sure how to pronounce that exactly, actuarial life tables. So here's a headline, right, from a, actually about 10 years ago, right, saying may, most babies born today may live to be uh, past 100. Actually, the pandemic has slowed that trend quite a bit. Uh, and here's my son, right? Uh, look at him. He looks like he's a different species uh, than I am. I'm kind of suspicious of my wife, although uh, that's just a, a, a bad joke. So there he is, uh, uh, 26 years old and possibly being able to uh, live into 80s and 90s and so forth. 
And it is actuarial tables that tell you a bit more about why cities have become more uh, sort of fashionable, if you will, than anything else, right? Because uh, what is sort of unknown, and especially amongst sort of, you know, the, the kind of typical suburban home builders is that families, the archetypal family, for whom, of course, the suburb was a, largely a pretty good place, <laughs> a home, a yard, a, actually, for other reasons, better schools and this and that and so forth. Uh, well, life by the acre appeals to families. But guess what? Families, that is, you know, two adults, they could be the same sex, uh, with a couple of school age kids represent less than a quarter of all American households. This was hardly the case a century ago or even half a century ago. And there's a kind of assumption in mind, well, yeah, you know, human, humans are made, into, are, are, are made up of families and that must be the majority. And therefore the majority wants an environment somehow uh, like you see in the background. Um, but what about the other 80%, 77, 80% of households, uh, right? The young, like most of you, I suspect in the audience, the old, like I am over there on the right, well, a suburban condition is not necessarily our first inclination. For the young, you're staying young longer. Uh, you are less interested in a backyard than colleagues, than a career, than in kind of the conviviality associated with sort of urban mixed use and so forth. For the old who want to hang, who now are able to hang around the planet longer uh, uh, after their, their, their children uh, sort of, you know, leave, uh, grow up and leave. Well, we want, you know, we don't want to mow lawns. We want to kind of, uh, you know, share also in the kind of activities we might want to pursue of a city. We might want to pursue second careers. Uh, we want to be closer to better health care. Yes, some of us maybe want to live next to golf courses, but uh, the majority are not looking for a suburban experience, uh, the so-called empty nesters, right? And here's the thing, right? Here's the kind of the, the, the situation for the families, which are now a small minority of all households, life by the acre still makes sense. And so the suburb is not gonna disappear uh, despite uh, some of us wishing it to happen. Whereas of course, uh, for the young, staying young longer and for the aging, hanging on the plant longer, life but a square foot makes more sense. And so as our lifespan increases, the proportion of our life dedicated to family building, right? Keeps getting smaller, right? You know, in the old days, you kind of, you know, you, you were born, you kind of grew up, you married, you, you, you had kids, uh, they left, they grew up, you died. Uh, a slight exaggeration. Uh, but for the young staying young longer into their thirties for the elder statesmen, uh, although they seem to be tipping over here. So I, I don't know about that, but uh, uh, they're, they're, you know, after the kids leave, they still have 20, 30, maybe 40 years left. So the proportion of a lifespan dedicated to family building for whom life by the acre or the eight of an acre and a home and the domestic spirit of grace dwelling in it still makes a fair amount of sense, but for 80%, not so, right? Uh, and that's something that's that kind of has been slow to be uh, understood by, you know, our politicians, our, our, you know, home builders, our home building associations, and so forth. All right. Well, of course, in order to achieve life by the acre, you needed a device in order to do so. If I ever write another book, uh, it's going to only have illustrations of car ads, which I think over the course of the 20th century would produce a pretty incredible uh, 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 array of uh, imagery and suggestiveness about, uh, uh, you know, um, the American sensibilities. Uh, there's the dad all happy, the mom in this case, unlike in the former photograph, uh, kind of not maybe not so uh, convinced. Uh, so there's no place like Buick. Here's this conjoining of a, of a machine in relationship to getting you to where you want to be, right? And there's Mr. Ford. Uh, we shall solve the problem of city by leaving the city with a particular instrument in mind. Uh, and as you can see, of course, the 8 million miles of roads versus the probably equal 8 million of abandoned railways that resulted during the 20th century. Uh, Henry Ford, uh, who of course, Franklin Wright used to quote a lot uh, uh, like this, of course, uh, succeeded, right? And look at, uh, of course, uh, you know, Detroit. Look at it in the 1930s, the fifth largest city, 
extensive transit. It looks like a real city. And it looks a bit more like the one on the left. And uh, the population of Detroit is almost a third of what it was. Think about that, of a city over a course of seven, seven decades, consistently losing population. There's a little bit of sort of signs now of a uh, kind of a, uh, a bit of a return, right? So uh, if I, uh, the other sort of book I would write would be only have one illustration in it, uh, and that would be this one, uh, the most sort of famous description of the kind of manifest destiny, the kind of precursor to no place like Buick, right? There's Lady American Progress. Uh, looks like she holds a laptop in her sort of in her hands, uh, not quite wireless, you can see. Uh, but in fact, what is she doing? Uh, well, it, for the painter, this was an ex extolling of the settlement of the West. And of course, in front of her, the Indians uh, and the buffalo are escaping and the good colonists are at her feet. Uh, that was the promise throughout 19th century America. But there's a kind of a more if you will, sort of insidious aspect to this uh, painting, other than, of course, you know, kind of ignoring, of course, uh, the indigenous population, which is, guess what she's doing? She's actually leaving where most of you are, I assume. In the background of this image is actually St. Louis. You can uh, see it by the Mississippi River. So Lady Progress is about leaving St. Louis to make a better one somewhere else rather than improving St. Louis. And that's another aspect of this notion of beginnings, kind of the eternal capability to begin again, uh, which sounds terrific, at the same time makes us less concerned with improving things that already exist, including places, as opposed to leaving them to form a better environment somewhere else, right? And again, Lady Progress with her ancestor, uh, no place like Buick, achieved this. Here's you know, a, a diagram of a sort of empty Baltimore and a list of some of the cities that lost population during much of the second half of the 20th century, uh, somewhat to the suburbs, uh, mostly to the suburbs around the periphery of those cities, also somewhat during kind of the continued migration from sort of the, the Atlant Northeast Atlantic coast to uh, the so-called Sun Belt, right? Detroit and St. Louis sort of leading the way, leading it perhaps, uh, and not, not perhaps uh, the right term to use, right? So again, there she is, uh, succeeding Baltimore not to be improved other than a small portion of its downtown, uh, but again, for seven decades once more, being emptied rather than improved upon uh, and even recent sort of a, 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 a recent crisis kind of a, a furthers uh, the plight of a place like Baltimore. Uh, and uh, across the, uh, the middle of the 20th century, again, in the form of policy, actually restricting reinvestment in places that already exist. Uh, the red diagram, the red box uh, represents, of course, the map, the size of the map and as the kind of the uh, uh, these maps drawn to uh, in, uh, to not enable you to to avoid you uh, uh, investing in existing places, right? With that kind of redlining system by banks uh, and indeed the government as well. Uh, well, of course, Durham expands substantially uh, as opposed to uh, enhancing what already has been there. Uh, and St. Louis was actually a leader in this, I might say. So here's Mr. Tugwell's quote back again, right? Go outside, centers of population, pick up cheap land, build a whole community and entice people into it. Then go back into the cities and tear down whole slums and make parks of them. This, you know, this was 20 years, uh, 15 years prior to urban renewal legislation, but it's a kind of a predictor. And indeed St. Louis does exactly that by demolishing 40 blocks of its waterfront on behalf of a park in honor of Lady Progress, actually, of American Progress, right? Here's one of the most kind of striking examples of what was called sort of white flight, right? Uh, in this uh, circle area, 80% of, may, many of you perhaps know this, I'm sure Pat Petty knows this, 80% of whites in that area left just in one decade uh, to uh, uh, begin again, uh, so to speak, in quotes. And that, of course, required then, as we sort of, uh, 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 as we left uh, St. Louis or Detroit or Boston for that matter, uh, as this photograph shows, uh, we had to figure out what to do with what was left. So we demolished most of it, of course, at the expense mostly of sort of minorities and 
and the less well-to-do portions of the citizens. Uh, and there's sort of our version in Boston. Uh, it's a great book now written uh, about this. Uh, uh, our version of uh, Robert Mose of New York saying, you can't make an omelet without cracking some eggs. Actually, I'm not sure he understood. He was quoting Joseph Stalin. And while it's true about the omelets, it may not tr be true about cities, though 50 years later, 60 years later, the return of sort of commercial investment to American cities for good and bad was partially a result of all this demolition uh, and uh, uh, renewal of so-called slum areas. And this is kind of one of the kind of most, one of the earliest and most sort of uh, impressive in quotes examples of this, the tearing down of what is called an obsolete neighborhood in the plan and the creation of a, a new plan. If you were a new urbanist uh, fan, uh, well, you would reverse these two titles, obviously, right? Uh, you'd be tempted to reverse these two titles. But here's the kind of the predicament at the time, right? Okay, so the old goes down, the new is built, and the sign, which is still there, now it's a, actually a kind of a landmark in Boston. The sign was built on the, on the edge of a highway leading out, on the edge of a road leading out uh, Boston, and saying, if you lived here, you'd be home by now. So to some extent, urban renewal was, you might say, an extremely kind of problematic way to say, hey, wait a minute, we are uh, enabling you to stay. That is, if again, if you were not a minority, uh, you're, we're enabling you to, it's a kind of a plea, stay. We're creating a situation for your state rather than head off uh, to the image on the lower right, as of course, most people, many people did. All right, but the heading off to the lower image on the right, again, is not dismissible. So let's say you're a Chinese uh, young man coming to study, well, not in St. in Wash U, but coming to study in a place like Charlotte, you just arrived by airplane and you're staying in a hotel overnight and you wake up on the third floor and you say, where is the rest of Charlotte? It can't just be 12 buildings. Well, uh, it is in those trees. And the idea of being in those trees uh, is something that is as fundamental to the kind of psyche of Americans as living in the 30th floor, if not more so, uh, of a hotel or, or an office building or a tower, residential tower in Charlotte. So let me introduce you to a Mr. Ray Stannard Baker. Look at him, a consummate urbanist, uh, a Pulitzer Prize winning author, an attache to President Wilson, uh, of course, you imagine him, yes, living in the capital of capitalism, Manhattan. But there is Mr. Baker writing a book <laughs> under a pen name. And I want to read this to you. One morning, and here, look at him. One morning, I wakened with a strange new joy in my soul. It came to me at that moment with indescribable poignancy the thought of walking barefoot in cool, fresh plafros as I had done a boy. And then I'll just skip a little bit of it, right? I thought of the sights and sounds, the heat and sweat of hayfields. I thought of a certain brook I knew a boy that flowed among elders and wild parsnips, where I waited with a three-foot rod for trout. And here's the thing that kind of breaks your, makes you kind of cry. I thought of all these things as a man thinks of his first love. So the association between, of course, uh, a kind of pastoral environment still plies upon the psyche of even people like Ray Stannard Baker, this consummate uh, sort of urbanist in his uh, other life, but somehow imagining a different existence, right? And that gets us back uh, uh, earlier in history with this wonderful t-shirt, which I'm sure all the transcendentalists would wear if it was available to them, right? The notion of maintaining a nature's nation, not an urban nation, a nature's nation in what was hoped to remain, to be and hope to remain a garden of the world. Right? Uh, and so don't sort of uh, overlook that, the, the remnants of that notion still within American culture, even though we hardly have the courage to say a nature's nation as we continue to kind of destroy it. All right, I, I'm afraid that I'm probably going on a little bit too long, but so give me maybe another five or seven minutes, uh, 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 if I may. Uh, and with, you might say a kind of distraction, but about a particular moment in time, uh, uh, the beginnings of the middle of the Civil War when the proclamation freeing the slaves uh, was made. 
And within the same three month period of con same three month period, three other incredible uh, acts of legislature took place. I say this to shame the useless Congress that we have today that seemed not to be able to pass any legislation whatsoever. But think about this. As Lincoln signs the Proclamation of Independence, three other monumental acts of Congress take place. One of which, of course, again, unfortunately at the expense of the Indians was the kind of the land rushes, finally after 60 years enabling Jefferson, Jeff, Jefferson's kind of vision of providing a homestead, a quarter section for all uh, Americans. Again, this time for women too, who are heads of households, but of course not yet for uh, uh, hardly Indians or African Americans. So look at this. Whoops, uh, sorry. So look, look at the lower photograph. You say, okay, that's the way Hollywood would depict the scene. This is literally, right, a photograph of the opening up of one of the first of these land rushes. Uh, amazing. That's how much of the West was settled. Think about this. And there's Oklahoma, uh, Guthrie, Oklahoma, four days after the land rush, a veritable city uh, instantly made because actually many of these uh, sort of uh, land rushers weren't interested in a course section. They were interested in a piece of uh, territory in a town uh, that they imagined would uh, grow in prosperity as it did for a period of time. Well, that was the sort of, in addition to freeing the slaves, uh, uh, there was the land rush, uh, the allowing upwards of several million Americans to acquire their core section or a town lot under the Homestead Act. The second act, uh, not unimportant to the day for sure, uh, was the Moral Act, not because of morals, but because of a Mr. Moral uh, that essentially created the public uh, university system in the country. 69 universities were established under the Morrill Act, that being that the federal government would release upwards of 30,000 uh, acres to any kind of state and they could do whatever they wish with that, so long as they use the proceeds from those land sales to create a public university, not to replicate a Harvard or a Princeton or Yale, but for applied knowledge, agriculture, engineering, mechanicals, and so forth. Uh, and so this was the moment, and we're talking about, you know, reducing uh, homes, uh, sorry, reducing loans for college students by whatever, 5,000 or so. This created 69 universities across a couple of decades, ultimately even in the South, uh, as they rejoined uh, the Union. And the third uh, uh, sort of act of Congress was to kind of fund the inter 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 intercontinental railroad system and again, uh, both, uh, of course, a poster from a railroad company saying, come, we'll give you a dollar one-way ride, uh, and then you can sort of uh, find a piece of California for you, or another kind of manifest destiny uh, uh, painting. Look at this, the train having settled this town, maybe heading off somewhere else, the Indians uh, being left in the smoke. And when we talk about trains, uh, uh, and the creation of the system, we have to, of course, turn ourselves to Chicago, my hometown, uh, which I depict in the book as actually the first Amazon. And it really was a century earlier. And by the way, don't, of course, don't complain about traffic when you see this scene of Chicago. Uh, there, there's the first sort of fulfillment centers, uh, not thanks to Mr. Bezos, but thanks to the ability of Chicago to uh, reach out hydro-like to get the resources from the rest of the country, transform them and send them back out as consumer goods. And you could of course acquire anything from these fulfillment centers. You just have to be a bit more patient uh, than today to get clothing or pieces of homes, uh, prefabricated or armaments uh, or anything else, including, but don't pay much attention to this sort of a mechanical garter belt that that young man is trying to uh, acquire. So indeed, uh, uh, Chicago uh, creates skyscrapers in part because it was the, the it, it was the Amazon of the late 19th century. Uh, it had to build vertically uh, to provide these fulfillment centers. And Chicago, never mind Henry Ford's assembly plant, he did not create the assembly plant. A more amazing one existed in Chicago 20 years before uh, 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 Ford's. But this was not to assemble machines. This was to disassemble animals upwards of 40,000 a day uh, as a, actually a way to feed uh, America. Uh, and hundreds of thousands of people would come from around uh, uh, the world, both from dysfunctional farms and from across the oceans to kind of 
work in this, you know, not ripple environments, but accept the possibility of a better life ultimately. And Chicago actually was the kind of the capital of capitalism before that moniker appropriately shifted to New York later on, including through the kind of the uh, organization of itself uh, around actually open space uh, in this kind of Chicago plan uh, uh, drawing by Daniel Burnham. The plan itself is oftentimes accused of being about classical architecture. Not so really. That's how he depicted it, the future because he wanted to kind of a uh, you know get his kind of commercial uh, clients interested. But what he's interested actually is maintaining the sensibility of the park movement, the kind of Amsterdam era of a couple of uh, uh, decades prior, and to create this, right? So he used these uh, classical renderings, uh, crazy, and of course by the modernists completely obliterating the actual benefits of the plan, he actually was interested in creating this incredible uh, opening up of the city to open space uh, and to its lakefront. And Chicago owes one more uh, uh, ode, one substantial ode, actually through the design of its World's Fair to Washington, D.C. Uh, and that chapter deals with, of course, the fact that although the plan of the capital was created in the 1790s, but who needed a capital for 100 years or so, uh, it, the, 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 the streets were laid out, some of them, but in fact, very little happened there. It was a capital only in the sense that government uh, occurred there, not in the sense that Paris is a capital, culture, so forth, uh, business. Uh, so it was not until the end of the 19th century at the centennial celebration of the founding of the nation's capital that people said, hey, this World's Fair is, made, is just a temporary, it's kind of an apparition, let's make it for real. And so most of the folks involved in the World's Fair actually tried to produce it for real in the nation's capital, including Burnham and McKim and so forth. Right? And so uh, I will end uh, here uh, in a few minutes. So during the kind of the end of the 19th century, many analogous today, great inequality, but great sort of a growth of industry and capitalism and the robber barons as they were called then producing cultural facilities and redesigning our capital and so forth, producing libraries and so forth. Uh, but much of the city still had that kind of quality about it. And so another group of people emerged and we're hoping that they would emerge today the equivalent of them that said, wait a minute, okay, yes, make cities more beautiful and all that stuff, but how do we actually uh, reach back to what the ideals of America were? And here's my kind of heroine, Jane Adams, not, not Jane Jacobs, <laughs> she comes much later, uh, saying uh, uh, something extraordinary, and we wish more would say this today, uh, right? The good the extent to all society before, it, it, it's not a good until of course uh, it is equally shared, uh, right? We cannot believe that it is worth acquiring such a good unless it is shared. What an amazing statement as you read it more carefully than I just did. Uh, and that leads me then to my optimism, believe it or not, call me naive, about possibly what the, what the aftermath of the COVID crisis might so these are kind of 10 interspersed crises. I won't read them all to you. They're very well known, right? And a number of them actually have become more evident, ironically, as a consequence of the virus, of the pandemic. And if we pay attention to that awareness, maybe something better might come. Remember early in last year, there were visions about how cleaner the air is because of course we were not in our cars, right? And a recent, of course, a headline saying, hey, you know, the big oil is no longer so big uh, and under great, great pressure to uh, sort of a reform, right? And let's keep Mount Everest visible, which it hadn't been for decades from sit Indian cities because of pollution. So we become more aware of, through our crisis, of the potential benefits of cleaner air. The fact that we are now work, separating ourselves from the places designated for work, as this California entrepreneur, all he needs is his you know, SUV and mobile home and his laptop to kind of make deals, may mean that we don't need as many of these sort of big, you know, kind of ugly office buildings, which may suggest that the downtown actually could become a little bit more 
mixed use in the future than simply a place for commerce. That might be a benefit actually, as uh, ironically of the COVID. The fact that uh, uh, in many cities because of our interest in sort of a consolidation uh, has made affordability virtually impossible for many, may actually reduce itself slightly as the pressure on sort of commerce uh, on, uh, and workplaces in the center of our cities is reduced because we are gonna continue to at least partially work from home. The fact that, uh, and this preceded the pandemic, the fact that uh, we no longer have to go places always to consume, uh, but some of the stuff can come to us. They also mean that the way in which we lay out cities might become a little bit more different, possibly more equitable, as opposed to dedicated, dedicated primarily to commerce and to workplaces. The fact that we become much more aware of uh, persistent racism, uh, whether we do something about it will be up to us, but the pandemic, you know, unfortunately made it much more apparent and perhaps we will respond more than we did in the prior several decades. The fact that we now sort of plead for more open space out of a need for social distance might indeed lead to kind of other versions of uh, the kind of Brooklyn uh, Bridge parks that are such an incredible addition to the open space system of New York City. And uh, I would say that the fact that we need to kind of separate ourselves a little bit more uh, out of a fear of pandemic may, may, and this is where I'm maybe the most optimistic and perhaps the, the silliest, may, over, may make us sprawl, but in a very different way than we have by trying to, as I said earlier, uh, to overcome the segregation uh, that leads to some of our crisis, the segregation among race, uh, income, uh, politics, uh, values, and so forth. So I end uh, with uh, this quotation, now 170 years old, about the importance of ideals. Ideals are like stars, this gentleman, another immigrant, by the way, uh, said, ideals are like stars. You will not succeed in touching them with your hands, but like the seafaring men in the desert of waters, you choose them as guides and following them will reach your destiny. And so hopefully a return to a certain idealism in the midst of all these crises will allow us to become guides in order to reach a better destiny. Thank you. End. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, I wanna encourage our audience to put some questions in the Q&A or the chat. We have one that I'll start off with. Um, this is coming from England. So I didn't know we had an international audience, which is <laughs> awesome. University of Reading, um, Matt Wargent is, is writing that English planning is currently undergoing another round of reform. It's moving toward a zonal system, which is away from a plan led discretionary system with the concentration on beauty and design. There's a worry that the concentration on local design guides is like a fig leaf for deregulating planning and its ability to combat strategic issues to, you know, to coordinate infrastructure, et cetera. So Matt is interested in your views, Alex, on combating the misuse of ideals, things like beauty, um, in this way. And by the way, the book was great. <laughs> I'm reading from the comment. I see. Well, I don't, you know, <laughs> uh, wow. Uh, gee, I wish time was up because that's a difficult question. I don't know enough about the, the English situation, but, but, I, but my point is, my point actually in sort of turning to ideals is also to become aware of which ones, right? Actually seek a a better situation for all, uh, which ones have, we have to be a little bit wary of. So actually the period that I just kind of ended on with Jane Adams and the kind of City Beautiful Era was called the City Beautiful Era. It went through a process, right? Uh, at the end of the 19th century of, of uh, you know, creating, you know, sort of beautiful uh, plazas and civic centers and courthouse squares and so forth. But until Jane Adams comes along and others uh, not attending to the very social needs uh, of our cities. I'm waiting for the other side to occur right now. Now we talk about cities in a very limited way. We talk about, therefore, the creative class. Now we have to be careful, we're all part of that creative class, but we rarely make up more than a minority, a small minority of any kind of urban population. So if the cities are only about the creative class, 
we leave behind, you know, seven tenths, eight tenths, nine tenths of the population. So I agree with you, right? I think we have to be quite careful in selecting those ideals, but aspirations uh, have to be essential. Otherwise, I think we sort of wallow in the miseries of, of uh, the existing crisis are now in this country, and I assume, to, hopefully to a lesser extent, uh, in England. Yeah, and I think there's a, um, I mean, I wanted to ask in relation to that about the, um, you know, you you sat on the Fine Arts Commission and we had Trump sort of oh. declaring a kind of, um, you know, we, on the one hand, yes, we look, I, yes. we look for the public sector to lead with aspiration, right? Green New Deal. And on the other hand, we have Trump talking about design and imposing design. So there's a kind of tension right there mm -hmm. in who controls the ideal and what yeah. ideal. <laughs> Not to kind of wallow in a wallow in in my own fortune. I was removed from the commission, as were the other commissioners, and replaced by a bunch of bow tie classicists. It's horrible. It may actually lead to the disbanding of the Fine Arts Commission, which over the course of 100 years, really back to the redesign of the capital, uh, actually played a very important role by advocating not beauty, but advocating kind of sensibility in the design of also public uh, uh, buildings, uh, places, parks, memorials. Uh, in, in, uh, so I think that, uh, yes, it's an example actually of the, the gentleman from, uh, from, from England's uh, point that uh, uh, ideals can certainly be bastardized, but that's not an excuse for uh, not pursuing them uh, in order to recover from a crisis. Yeah. Um, there's there's two other questions here that are I think are kind of related. So let me just try to <laughs> um, to merge them. One is um, asking about the an ideal type of sprawling regarding your first few slides <laughs> and the last slides in terms of um, needing more red than the gray area. So that's one yes. question. And then the other is um, from Eric Mumford. Ah, Eric. Hello, Eric. Right. Hello, Eric. Um, yeah. How might we think about the urban design of the necessary new form of sprawl? So also asking about this, yeah. this new new sprawl, um, say, <laughs> right. as it is across Missouri from St. Louis to Columbia or... All right. All right. So, so first of all, I, I apologize. The, the term sprawl is uh, rhetorical and I think meant to kind of catch people off guard, right? What I think the pandemic uh, may enable us to think more about, as by the way, was the prediction uh, when the digital age first sort of emerged, that we didn't all have to be in Boston or New York City in order to kind of benefit from a metropolitan right, uh, a situation or postmodern economies and so forth, right? Uh, now, the opposite has happened actually in the last couple of decades. We seem to kind of, you know, business or economies seem to kind of help consolidate us. But what I'm trying to suggest is that, uh, and by the way, as is being experimented with in China right now, we'll see, they may be leading in this regard as opposed to us. It's not so clear that you know, 10 cities of 10 million would be a better situation than 50 cities of 1 million. And that's the point about kind of sprawling in a different direction. Uh, because actually, the more you see about that map, you realize that uh, the more we concentrate, even as we, yes, suburbanize, right? The more we concentrate, the more of these crises become more evident. You know, separation of people, unlike ourselves, primarily, right? Values, it comes race and so forth. And I think that has to become, that has to, that may be overcome, not because we all of a sudden become good citizens again, but through uh, a different way of thinking about how large does a city have to be and how many we need in order to assure a certain interaction amongst unlike-minded individuals, rather than, of course, New York being, or Boston being the center of liberalism, uh, but the rest of the country, of course, thinking we're all full of whatever, four-letter word. So that's, so I, I use the term sprawl, not so much in its nominal uh, use, uh, but in terms of whether or not uh, the future pandemic or not, right? The digital age though, uh, will enable us to realize that we may not need cities of 10 million to become great, uh, but maybe we need to kind of rethink about how we sort of settle ourselves across the continent in smaller but more 
uh, interactive and more and less sp less less segregated environments. And that's of course the the the, the whatever the idealist in me speaking. <laughs> I'm not sure how to get to that point to that point, right? Um. Okay, so this might be related. Hold on, let me. There's another. Question Again, please don't, don't assume that I'm a kind of a sprawler in the kind of let's build more generic suburbs, right? <laughs> um, there is an um, there is emerging research that's probing the future of urban design in terms of the pandemic, mm -hmm. which is um, necessary in terms of quality life. I'm sorry, I'm reading this question. I'm <laughs> wondering how serious we treat the pandemic as a driver in the movement towards this next generation of urban design? This well, that's, that's why my last four or five slides tried to get at, right? Uh, uh, there's, at the moment, there's a kind of overreaction to, uh, uh, okay, we need to separate, we need more public space, we need more parks, uh, maybe we need to suburbanize because it's dangerous uh, to, to, to live, you know, in an apartment next to those that you don't know and who might be infected. So there's this, you know, understandable overreaction. By the way, uh, think about this. After 9-11, there was no more skyscrapers ever in, in, in New York. Well, think about all those kind of stupid needle towers that go on 2,000 feet high uh, that's been built since then. So predictions about a crisis immediately during the crisis really come to the fore. But this is what I'm saying, but certain insights that have become more evident as a consequent crisis may, if we are intelligent enough, uh, lead us not to suburbanize more, but to create more open space in our cities, right? And, and not to kind of, uh, not to think about downtowns as being about commerce only, but actually start thinking about a more of a mixing of uses throughout our cities, right? Uh, because we don't need office buildings everywhere, at least giant ones, right? So this is, th that was the point of my last couple of, uh, of you know, kind of let's say utopian uh, guesses about how the pandemic, the troubles that it's caused will, if we're intelligent enough, will lead us to think differently about the way cities could become better organized in terms of size, in terms of use, uh, in terms of uh, uh, in, in amenities such as open space, in terms of uh, mobility systems. Um, so I would probably have to wrap up soon. I wanna ask you one more question because we have students in the audience and because you have bridged academia and practice. <laughs> And, um, and in light of the crises that we're facing all around us, um, you know, in some ways we've had these visions and look where we've ended up, you know, in terms of uh, like how you started off, right? Um, what's the number one thing design schools should be focused on? What should students be pushing for? I'm just curious, because I think there's a critique of practice. There's a sort of, um, you know, look to practice to lead there, you know, we're asking, we have ambitions of the Green New Deal and yet how to get it done. And I'm just wondering as we navigate um, moving into this new world of resetting the vision, right? Yeah. Resetting um, the vision for, uh, I guess, more people. How, like what, what should we be focused on? Yeah. Well, of course, you know, if I had, if I, uh, whatever, if I had the answer to that, I, whatever, I'd be dean of all, all <laughs> institutions across America. Not that I ever wanted to be dean, actually, <laughs> uh, uh, of any institution. So, so look, uh, I would say in a, you know, kind of a, again, slightly more rhetorical way, an important aspect of design education should be how to cultivate better clients. Now you might think that's silly. No, we have to learn about how to make form and design and this and technology and so forth. Uh, all, of course, right? But there's a way that unless we are part of enlightening our clients, and I don't mean by you know by by you know by being arrogant, right? But unless we can think about in our work about how to kind of make better clients uh, or more responsive clients, not just to their particular project, uh, but to its their particular project's impact upon neighborhood projects, we will, you know, we will, uh, you know, succumb as practitioners, which we often do to kind of solving the client's needs. By the way, to say we don't want to solve the client's needs also sounds stupid. Of course, we have to solve the client's needs. But the idea of finding a way through our own education, through our own insights about how to cultivate more enlightened clients would go a long way uh, 
to allowing us to also practice better. Again, not by convincing them of all of our weird ideas, but by uh, uh, enabling them to think a little bit more, I don't know, altruistically is the wrong word, a little bit more socially minded in terms of uh, the impact of a project on its immediate and even distant uh, uh, regions. So that's what I would say. So how do you do that? I don't know, but I think that that should be, and I think that students, even more than old faculty, <laughs> students, I think, are more understanding of this. For instance, at the GSD right now, one of the big campaigns among the students is, we have no course on the ethics of the profession. <laughs> and indeed, we don't. Uh, well, you know, back when 30 years ago, and 40 years ago, when I was a student, <laughs> more than that, we didn't think about ethics of the profession. We just wanted to practice and design and so forth. So there's a certain realization that I would put under the umbrella of, finding ways to nurture more enlightened clients will, and of course the academy can do so much more easily than actually the profession uh, might be one way to think about uh, heading towards a better future. How's that? <laughs> no, that's great. Um, so I thank you so much for joining us and for talking to us. And um, if anyone has additional questions, feel free to email them, I think. Yeah, you, you can email, email them to me. Ways. Yeah, and uh, yeah. If, I, I doubt that I'll be bombarded by them. So if two or three come, I'd be happy <laughs> to answer them. And thank you for inviting me. And, and I'm sorry I didn't talk about practice more, but perhaps I can come back on another occasion and talk more about practice as opposed to uh, oh, it'd be great. foundational and, ideals. And ideal, you know, hopefully come, actually come here too. It's that sunny and 60 here. So that that's, would be great. that's how we'll yeah. entice you. I will look thank forward to Thank you so much. That. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Alex, you and happy birthday. Oh, yes. Thank Great you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. So long. Bye.